Okay, welcome back everyone for the second slot of the protect, protection session. Uh, we are going to see the next six talks of this session. The first video is uh, by Anki Lee. Um, and the title of the talk is Modeling Yarn Reorientation in Woven Composites Under Off-Axis Tensile Loading with Cohesive Zone-Based Conformal Meshing. Uh, so we can start with the, with the video now. Hello everyone, I'm Anchili. My topic today is cohesive zone-based conformal meshing of yarn contacts in woven composites. There are a lot of existing geometry generation tools for woven composites, but the voxel-based meshing technique is robust, but the jack surface might cause convergence problem. The texture and Y stacks are common geometry generation tool, but the generated RVE is not always free of interpenetration. An image-based approach can reconstruct complex woven composites, but it requires the image of an existing specimen. Before introducing my work, let me first introduce two tools which I base my work on. The first is an RVE generation tool by Vadajida Winterbar. The RVE is represented by implicit function gen generated based on a CT scan or an existing geometry generation tool or self-defined weaving patterns. The second is a mesh generation tool by Kahim Kamal. With the given implicit geometry, the volume mesh is generated with Stellone triangulation. During the meshing process, the mesh will be optimized with person strand trust analogy. Those tools are capable to generate conformal mesh for complex geometry. The problem is that the nature of the sign distance function requires a minus or plus sign to distinguish the yarn boundaries. For yarns in contact, a matrix gap is needed in between. For the RVE shown here, it requires 10 million elements and 1 million nodes. Such mesh is computationally costly to perform simulations. That's why I'm proposing a methodology to remove the matrix gap and replace it with interface elements. The proposed method is illustrated in 2D with two inclusions. In the first graph, we can see two circles representing two inclusions. In the second step, we generate the arc tree background grid. We can identify the nodes within and around inclusion regions and perform Delaunay triangulation. In the fifth step, based on the center gravity of the elements, we identify the elements that belong to each inclusion and extract the outer boundary nodes. We also identify the contact nodes which are located around implicit function M12, which is the mid surface of inclusion one and two, marked in gray. The identified node sets are zigzag, not exactly located on the inclusion geometries. The next step is to project the nose to its corresponding geometry based on the sine distance function. Now, here's the full algorithm. In the first step, we generate the volume mesh with arc tree nodes. In the next step, both the surface and the contact node sets are identified. Then in each iteration, the volume mesh is optimized. The surface and the interface nodes are projected to their corresponding implicit geometry. Naturally, projecting the nodes will result in bad quality elements and even mesh intersection, as can be seen in the first iteration. So in every 10 iteration, a retriangulation will be performed to reshuffle the mesh connectivity. As you can see, at iteration 100, the yarn surface is well presented. Here's another example of a plan with RVEs with different yarn aspect ratio. The first row is yarn mesh by inserting a small matrix gap between yarns, and the second row is the RVE with interface mesh between yarns. The mesh with gap insertion requires millions of elements. 
With interface element, we have 90 to 95% reduction, both in number of nodes and number of elements, and also slightly improved mesh quality. The final element simulations are performed in Abacus for plan with RV. The bottom right figure shows the low displacement curve. After the initial linear phase, the stiffness of the RVE is decreased due to the damage of the cohesive elements in the interface. The curve hit the plateau and even slightly softened. The damage variable of the cohesive zone elements is also presented. The conclusion is that by meshing the young RVE with contact surface, the mesh size is reduced drastically. Also, with the cohesive zone element, simulating the yarn, yarn, and yarn matrix debonding is easily observed. Future work will include improve the, robust, the robustness of the mesh generation tool, observe the reorientation of woven yarns, and the homogenization of complex 3D woven composites. Thank you for your attention. Hello, Sergio. Um, I'm back here. I'm sorry, I was in the lunch uh, <laughs> waiting room and uh, and then it didn't transfer. I, I missed the, the entrance. Mm -hmm. No problem at all. So you continue? So uh, I, I guess you made a little introduction with the protection project and, and everything, right? That's correct. So, uh, yeah. The next talk is from Luan, if you want to yes, introduce it. Exactly. So the next talk is going to be held by Luan Malikowski. He's uh, also Brazilian, like me. Um, he is going to talk about the phase centered finite volume method for incompressible flows. Um, hope you guys enjoy it. If you have any questions, please uh, address it on the chat. And at the end, we're going to be reading all the questions that you have. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Luan Vieira and today I'll be talking about the phase center finite volume method for incompressible flows. In CFD industry, the flow or the finite volume methods, they are very widespread because they present a very good trade-off between the computational cost and the accuracy of the methodologies. They are very robust for several applications and they do not require the generation of high order meshes. Lower the codes, they are present through several examples in industry and all of them they have in common they are unstructured grids and also they are cell center finite volume method or vertex center finite volume method. The first one, the solution is computed at the dual mesh center, while the second one, the solution is computed at the mesh vertex. The main characteristic of these methodologies is, is, is that they require the reconstruction of the flux at the control volume boundaries. This means that they are usually iterative approaches and they have a main drawback that the flux reconstruction and the accuracy of the method is very much compromised by the mesh quality. The face center finite volume, on the other hand, is a methodology where the solution is found at this mesh skeleton or at the face of the elements by means of a hybrid variable or by means of hybridization. And this hybrid variable is shared between elements. So firstly, we solve a global solution for this hybrid variable then we go element by element to solve for the velocity, the gradient of velocity, and the pressure. With this methodology, we have a piecewise constant degree of approximation for all variables, and we are able to get optimal convergence rates for the velocity, the pressure, and the velocity gradient. Consequently, there is no need for the gradient reconstruction. And also, this method turns out to be insensitive to grid distortion and grid stretching. Also, this methodology is highly parallelizable in the sense that it's very suitable for parallel computing given the characteristics of the global problem and also the local problems that are very that are decoupled. In this project, we are using a Fortran 19 for and which is very much efficient for GFD applications. And also we are taking advantage of the sparse structure of the method for, for storage and, and using sparse solvers like GMRS and multifrontal Gauss elimination. And here I'll show you some numerical examples, starting with the steady compressible number stokes flow for the lead driven cavity. As you can see here, the string lines for different Reynolds number are captured in accordance with the literature. 
And here there are optimal rates of convergence that are attained for the velocity, the gradient of the velocity of the pressure. And the, as you can see, they are insensitive to Reynolds number. And also, we need to stress that we don't need the wave construction of the gradient to have a first order convergence. Another numerical example that I'm showing is the unsteady compressible Harvard Stokes flow plus cylinder for Reynolds equals 100, which is a well known benchmark in the literature. As you can see here, we have the boundary conditions for the problem, and we are using a time integration, which is the BDF2, with delta t equals to 0, 0 0.5, and a mesh to discretize the domain with about 1 million elements, with a refinement neural of the cylinder to capture well the gradients, to capture well all the quantities of interest around the cylinder. As you can observe in here, the solution field at t equals to 125 for the velocity component 1, velocity component 2, and pressure. As you can observe, they are not that much uh, numerical dissipative. There, there is no much numerical dissipation in there. And also for the quantities of interest that are time dependent, like the drag coefficient and lift coefficient, uh, we can observe in this table the comparison between the results that were very well documented in the bibliography and the results of the present work, as you can see, the store hall number, the lift coefficient, and the mean drag coefficient are very well in accordance with the bibliography, with the range that those authors are presenting. As a summary of our discussion, the phase center finite volume for fluid problems is a methodology that presents optimal rate of convergence for velocity, pressure, and the gradient of velocity, which are very important aspects for the computation of aerodynamics quantities of interest. The methodology does not require the iterative process to reconstruct the gradient, which is required for other methodologies in industry. It's also insensitive to the grid quality, so it can handle all general construct grids that are presenting several software service generation in industry. And also they are very capable of capturing all the flow features, as you could see for, from the numerical results. As a further development, we are going to full parallelize the code in the Fortran environment and also extend the methodology to, uh, to the runs equation with turbulence models that are used in industry and in real problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, uh, so thank you Luan for your presentation. Uh, I'm gonna encourage you to, to ask your questions for Luan's presentation and at the end we can uh, discuss them. So the next present, uh, presentation is from Varun Maruga. Uh, he's also a colleague of ours. And he's talk, gonna talk about the Feynman path optimization with uh, curvilinear trajectories for additive manufacture, manufacturing of load bearing components. Um, once again, I encourage you guys to make very nice uh, questions so we can discuss at the end. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm happy to be presenting in the 10th International Conference on Adaptive Modeling and Simulation. I am Varun Murugan and I'm doing a joint doctorate program between University of Pavia and Italy and ULB Belgium. Today I'm going to present my work titled Filament Path Optimization with Curvilinear Trajectories for Additive Manufacturing of Load-Bearing Components. We are interested in designing load-bearing parts for a very common additive manufacturing technology called Fused Filament Fabrication. It's an extrusion-based process from which the part produced have a strong anisotropy due to the direction of extrusion and also possess gaps and voids that deteriorate the part properties. Currently these parts are largely used for prototyping and only for some non-critical functions. One of the reasons is that the existing methods to design and print parts they majorly favor only prototyping needs. For example, these predefined filament patterns used by the slices software to print parts they are not really helpful when we want to produce structural parts. So in order to obtain the best response from the part produced, you will have to choose the right angle and density through optimal placement of filaments. So hence we resort to the approach of filament path optimization in which we solve a, a constraint minimization problem uh, where the uh, goal is to find the optimal filament path that minimize the complaints of the part or maximize the stiffness of it subject to the manufacturing constraints of fused filament fabrication. The concept that we use to solve this problem is that the filament paths can be considered as level sets or contours of a function phi. And by finding the optimal shape parameters, we can yield the optimal filament paths. 
so we consider two scenarios first one is the single layer solution in which we assume that the sa same filament layout is repeated for all the layers and that the trajectories of these uh, filaments are from uh, the contours of the function phi and similarly for the two layer solution we consider two separate filament layers that are stacked on on top of each other to complete the part and the parts from parts of the filaments are considered from the contours of two separate functions phi a and phi b defined over it so we consider the design variables of the minimization problem as the shape parameters uh, and the manufacturing constraints that we impose are the uh, no overlap constraint and maximum gap constraint the no overlap refers that the uh, means that the filaments cannot overlap into each other and this is denoted as g1 and the maximum gap says that the filaments cannot have large gaps and this is denoted as g2 and by substituting the appropriate quantities for the single layer and two layer solutions we convert the constraint problem into an unconstrained problem using penalty method and this unconstrained problem is solved using a framework that we developed using mathematica and hgen and uh, in this framework the optimization algorithm uses the design variable to change to change the shape of function phi which in turn produces change in the filament angle spacing and also the uh, manufacturing quantities further this information is sent to the structure which is encoded to be receptive to changes in uh, filament angle and density due to the defined material model and gives a suitable response and this loop continues until the optimization algorithm finds the minimal value for compliance so let us look at a numerical example in which we try to find the optimal filament paths of an mbb beam with symmetry conditions uh, we considered uh, transverse isotropic material properties with uh, 25 design variables the problem is solved using quasi newton a local gradient based method and differential evolution uh, which is a meta heuristic method so uh, the results are shown and we can compare the single layer and two layer solution uh, first inference is that in case of both quasi newton and differential evolution the two layer solution is uh, more compact and more dense uh, with lesser gaps and can lead to a stiffer response uh, thanks to the uh, more number of design variables employed this is possible and second the differential evolution uh, it is able to reach the global solution but it is more expensive on the downside and uh, in the finding the right parameters to reach the solution is also difficult uh, it is a tedious process quasi newton on the other hand it is faster than the differential evolution you can see that the time consumption is in the range of minutes where the differential evolution take hours and uh, but the issue is that uh, it may converge to a local solution if a suitable starting point is not chosen and sufficient uh, effort has to be taken uh, to uh, pick the right uh, initial point for the uh, quasi newton so that to conclude uh, i would like to say that we've developed a computer based framework to find the optimal filament path solution and the highlight is that the method that we used facilitated manufacturing by giving production ready filaments and uh, and these filaments can be directly converted into g code to print the parts so uh, for further work we will log we will we will like to f uh, f uh, develop a um, accurate material model since current material model is only an approximation and further we would like to print parts and do an experimental comparison with the state of the art design solutions so i'd like to thank the european union for funding this project and thank you Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Varun. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please address it to the chat. Uh, now we're going to have an expert uh, presentation from uh, our colleague Christina Nasica, uh, which is entitled "Enhancing uh, Sensor Monitor of Earth Field Dams Using Model Order Reduction." Um, presentation is going to go on. Thank you. Hello, I am Christina Nasica, and I will be presenting today my work on model order reduction for enabling sensor monitoring and data assimilation for earthfill dams. This work is part of my doctoral thesis, supervised by Pedra Diaz and Sergio Slotnik from UPC Barcelona, and Thierry Massar and Pierre Gerard from uh, ULB Brussels. It has received funding from the European Union as part of a project named Protection. 
The main objective of my thesis is to develop technologies for dam monitoring that involve a numerical model able to receive sensor data and estimate pressure and stress states of the dam in real time. The model will be continuously updated and upgraded in terms of accuracy by calibration with respect to incoming sensor data throughout the life of the, of the Earthfield Dam. An essential obstacle that is dealt with in this work is the response time of the model. In order to have real-time continuous monitoring and data assimilation, high computational efficiency is required. So, in this work, model order reduction is applied to the coupled hydromechanical equations that describe water flow through earthfall dams in order to spe speed up the response of the model. So, the coupled problem is described by two governing equations, the mechanical equilibrium and the water mass conservation equation that describes the flow. We are solving for two unknown fields, displacement and pore water pressure. Uh, due to the fact that we are considering partial saturation for the porous material, non-linearities are introduced to most of the terms of the coupled problem, and those terms are highlighted here in red color. In terms of constitutive modeling, linear elasticity is considered for the soil and Darcy's law for the groundwater flow. The finite element model for solving these coupled equations was initially developed using Phoenix Project, an open source platform for finite element modeling. The system was solved using a monolithic approach for the coupling. Then, the reduced order model was created by using the reduced basis method, which is a POD based method for model reduction. It is essentially a method per performed in two steps, the offline stage where the manifold of possible solutions for different possible input is sampled and processed in order to identify a low order space where all the possible solutions can be sought for. Then in the online phase, um, a transformed, much smaller sized system of equations may be solved in order to acquire any solution that corresponds to um, an, input, an input in the domain of inputs that has been sampled. In order to examine the efficiency gains achieved by the reduction and the level of accuracy of the reduced model, a parameterized problem was solved. This problem describes realistic conditions that often occur in some types of earth dams. The domain that you can see in the video represents a cross-section of a dam, and the black line represents the phreatic line. The water level upstream, so on the left part, is kept constant, and gradually a mechanical load is applied on the top of the domain. As a result, and due to the hydromechanical coupling, water pressures build up and therefore the water, level, the water table rises. The parameter examined here is the saturated hydraulic conductivity, which was taken to range along the domain of realistic values. To examine the performance of reduced model in 2D and 3D setups, a similar problem was solved too in, in 3D. You can see the geometries that correspond to the 2D and 3D setup in the pictures on the top of the slide. Finally, it turns out that using the reduced basis method, we can solve these nonlinear transient problems 3 to 15 times faster than with the finite elements, while always obtaining very high accuracy with respect to the results of the finite elements method. This study and our results are detailed in our article that has not yet been published, but a non-reviewed uh, preprint can already be found online. Finally, some words on what we are working on currently. We are dealing with uh, two issues. Firstly, it seems that assembling the finite element operators for this uh, time-dependent non-linear problem takes up most of the time that our reduced order model uh, needs to run. So we are currently trying to apply hyper-reduction in order to boost the efficiency of the reduced model even further. And secondly, uh, as a step toward data assimilation, we are solving inverse problems, uh, basically parameter identification problems, using the reduced order model that has been developed. This is all for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Christina. It was very interesting. Uh, with a lot of applicability in my country, in Brazil, we have lots of problems with uh, dams and water and sliding. It's actually a big problem over there. 
Now uh, we're going to have another presentation from a very good friend of mine, uh, Paulo Refaschinho. He is going to present uh, uh, the study of this presentation is uh, stabilized updated Lagrangian SPH for fast solid dynamics. Hope you guys enjoy. My name is Paulo Refaschinho de Campos, and I'm going to talk about smooth particle hydrodynamics in the context of fast solid dynamics. By fast solid dynamics, we mean any sort of short duration dynamic event where we can face large deformation, impact, fracture, and fragmentation. I have many examples here, and if we, we think about approaching these problems using mesh-based techniques, such as the finite elements method, we can potentially suffer from mesh distortion. As an alternative, a variety of mesh-free methods appeared along the past few years, including the smooth particle hydrodynamics. So among the many advantages of mesh-free methods, I want to highlight the fact that since we don't have interconnected elements, it seems to be easier to take into account uh, discontinuities. So, to represent failure, fracture, and fragmentation. But unfortunately, classical SP8 formulation is said to be not robust, meaning that it works for some cases, but eventually it doesn't work for others. And with this context in mind, so taking into account the advantages, the drawbacks, and also the context of fast soil dynamics, we want to come up with a robust SP8 framework. So, for doing this, we are proposing a mixed-based formulation where the conservation law of linear momentum is supplemented with conservation laws for the formation gradient F, area map H, and also the volume map J. And we write these equations in what we call an incremental updated Lagrangian formulation, meaning that these equations are written in terms of an intermediate configuration taking into account the multiplicative decomposition of the deformation. To illustrate this, let's say we have at time t0 our initial configuration and the reference configuration is coincident with that initial configuration. So we will solve for increments of deformation referring back to this reference configuration. We can do it for a few time steps and what I'm showing here it's just a standard total Lagrangian formulation. But if after any time steps, we decide to update this reference configuration and make it coincident with the current configuration that we have at time tn, and then reinitialize the computation of the incremental deformations, now referring back to this updated configuration, and then we can do it for another n time steps, and eventually after this, another any time steps, we will decide to update it again. So this is an incremental updated Lagrangian formulation. So the SP8 method has its foundations in interpolation theory. So here are my equations for P, F, H, and J in their same discrete form. And I summarize some of the main characteristics of the, the framework. So I want to show you now some examples, starting with isothermal elasticity. So I have the standard benchmark of a bending column, where we update our reference configuration every single time step. And I'm showing here that by doing these very frequent updates, I did not activate any spurious mode, which is very nice. My results compare very well against the total Lagrangian results. If we look at the energies, as I refine my model, I get less and less numerical dissipation, showing the consistency of the scheme. So moving into plasticity now, I have the standard Taylor impact bar. Here I'm showing different snapshots of the simulation. We can see Vomice's stress is very smooth and also the evolution of the plastic strengths. If we look at the energies, we can see the transfer between kinetic going very quickly to zero and then the problem being dominated by the plastic dissipation. 
if we look at the pressures, everything very smooth. And also we can compare the, the measure of the radius in the impact region against what was published by other authors. And then we can see that we are converging to those results. I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. So thanks uh, for your presentation, Paulo. It was very interesting as well. Um, now we're going to have our last presentation for the session. Uh, it's going to be uh, performed by uh, Biru Satesh. And uh, the title of the presentation is The Computational Model for Large Volume Expansion and Self-Contact with Adapted Mesh. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, once again, uh, you are free to ask it in the chat. Hello, I'm Abhirup Sadish. Let's discuss our work on computational modeling of large expansion of forms. The objectives of our work are to first to develop a material model for large expansion, secondly to develop thermomechanical contact methods based on motor and ghost point to segment discretization, and finally to set it up uh, iterative surveys for large monolithic systems. The presentation is organized as in four sections. Let's see the first the material model. So the initial boundary value problem of a thermomechanics can be written as uh, in the equation where the first two equations are the moment equation and the heat transfer equation respectively. The large expansion is model with multiplicative decomposition of the deformation gradient into elastic and expansion part. The second hierarchical of stress sensor for a, such a decomposition can be written in terms of hyperelastic strain energy function as in the equation. Sure. Let's see how the expansion part is uh, modeled. The expansion part is modeled in principal stress directions. The spectral decomposition reads as in the equation where lambda g is the expansion magnitude and n i is the principal stress directions. The expansion magnitude is determined with an explicit evolution law. Here the lambda dot is the expansion rate expand the expansion rate is defined by three function mainly ft fi and fp where ft is the expansion induced by chemical reaction with temperature dependent reaction parameters and fi is the stress law which accelerates expansion and fp is the function that prevents unlimited expansion now let's have a look into an example of a symmetric hollow cylinder which is allowed to expand in radial and in axial direction the initial configuration as shown in the figure and the final configuration for stress dependent and stress independent are shown in the figure where you can see that the stress dependent law accelerates the expansion and the final deformed configuration as shown in the figure where the annular space is closed after the expansion. Now let's have a look into the contact method. Now, now let's have a look into a thermomechanical contact. For a thermomechanical contact there are three interface conditions to be satisfied. The first one is in the normal direction, a non-penetration condition, and in secondly, in tangential direction, a frictional constraint, and finally, a heat balance and the interface, including heat generation due to friction. Now, the weak form contains contact virtual work. Adding contact virtual work does not enforce the contact constraint. We need to have constraint enforcement methods. To account for a heat transfer, one can substitute the heat fluxes directly into the thermal weak form this method is called heat substitution method. Now let's have a look into the constraint enforcement methods. Here we focus on Lagrosche multiplier method and penalty method. In Lagrosche multiplier method, we have additional primary field for unknown traction and heat flux, whereas in penalty method, we regularize the contact tractions with the gap functions. In order to evaluate this contact tense, we use motor discretization, where we have an interpolation function for the Lagrosche multiplier and also we have a Gauss point to segment discretization where we have a discrete Lagrosche multiplier at the Gauss points. Now let's see the solution schemes. Now the thermomechanical system results in the equation shown. To couple these two fields, we use monolithic scheme owing to its robustness and accuracy and efficiency. So in order to solve this large system of equation, we use multi-grid methods such as BGS-AMG 
and AMG BGS, a typical structure of the multigrid method is shown in the figure. Let's see an example of skewing of a cylinder by expanding blocks. Here we use motor penalty with heat substitution for the contact and a multigrid solver for the solution scheme. The final configuration as shown in the figure and our framework is able to handle large number of contact, self-contact and multi-body contact. Moving on to the summary and the outlook. Summarizing, we have the material model for large expansion, thermomechanical contact methods and uh, iterative solver for monolithic systems. Currently, we are working on mesh adaptation scheme to preserve mesh under large deformations. Here are the few references and uh, this project is funded by European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program and thank you for your attention. Hello, um, so that was our last presentation for this session. Uh, we're going to go now for the questions. Uh, let's start with uh, Varun. There is a couple of questions for Varun, actually. Um, okay, so the first question is from Professor Sergio Zlotnik. Um, the question is... Is the noise... No, it's fine. For Varun, uh, your optimization is done imposing some boundary conditions. What happens if you want to optimize and find the best configuration for a set of several different boundary conditions simultaneously? Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for the question, Professor. Uh, right now we are doing, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we are just optimizing, uh, I mean, we are finding the best element paths for a particular condition uh, for the structure. Uh, if we want it, if we want to find uh, the optimal paths for a different condition, we'll have to change the conditions and perform the uh, optimization again. But uh, I mean, uh, if I want to, I, I don't know how to do that. I mean, consider simultaneously a set of boundary conditions, but it could be really useful because uh, uh, finding a optimal filament paths for a, a, a couple of uh, different conditions could be useful and it could be helpful for uh, supporting a generic kind of loading. But uh, right now we are not doing that. Uh, if you have some ideas, please uh, share it and uh, yeah. Okay, uh, now another one for Varun. Uh, this is from Enrique Nadal. Uh, is your method applied only to small domains or it's also applied for uh, more complex domains? That is, is it, uh, it is a two-level approach or a single-level approach? Is that a question for me? Yes, Varun as well. Uh, can you please repeat? I mean, because I didn't see that in the chat window. Can you please repeat? No problem. It, it, it was directed to me. So uh, it's, it's basically here. So uh, to Varun, is your method applied only to small domains or is or is it also applied to a more complex domain? That yeah, is it is also applicable for complex domain. I did not present the example here, but uh, uh, I've also I have some results for larger domains than what I've shown in the results, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, now our next question is for Luan. So the question is, do you have some application in mind to use the turbulent FCFB method? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. So hi everyone, uh, actually now we didn't narrow down the the object application of the thesis, but we think about using this on the aerospace or automotive industry where we use a lot of these hands codes with lower the finite, finite volume method. So there we could present an option for the codes that have in industry. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we know that Luan in comparison with the other PhD students, uh, he started a little bit later, right? So maybe that's why he didn't uh, complete it yet. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, All this part. <laughs> so another question for Anki now, uh, it's the first presentation. So what quality measure is used to optimize the mesh? Does it take into account length, area, and volumetric quantities, or just the length of the edges? Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Uh, in my case, so 
to to check out if the mesh is good enough we basically because uh, in every iteration the nodes will move and then uh, we'll check like how much the node uh, move in each iteration and when the movements the sum of the movements of all nodes are small enough and um and then that's the first criteria that the mesh is good enough because no, not much changes. And the second criteria is that because initially we have a sized function which defined um, how much the bar, the truss of the mesh should be. And then we compare that with the actual mesh, the bar length. And if that one is matching the um, uh, size, the result given by the size function, then that means that the mesh is uh, what we wanted, basically. And then we also, uh, because that part is just to generate a valid mesh. And then later on, there are a specific uh, process just to optimize the mesh better. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now, there's actually another question for Varun. Uh, it's from myself. Um, so basically, uh, Mathematica is a bit slow. Uh, I use it as well, but not directly on my code. But uh, to this finite element computations, I think it becomes very slow. Do you think this affects your performance very much, or is it very a light version of uh, the code in Mathematica that you're using? Uh, thank you, Bruno. Uh, it's a good question, actually. Uh, that's why we use ASGen. Uh, Mathematica itself is uh, very slow due to the symbolic. Uh, uh, capabilities, but when uh, I, uh, I I use the package called Asgen, it's uh, really fast and uh, and uh, it's it it simultaneously also use the symbolic capabilities and while also making it fast. So Asgen has uh, some basic uh, subroutines for finite elements. So uh, using that uh, and also uh, it also permits to do uh, any other alteration or changes. So it's uh, really cool. Okay, thank you very much. If you don't mind, uh, if you can uh, type the, the name of this, this package on the chat, uh, I'll actually a bit curious to see how it goes. Um, okay, so now we have two questions for Abiru. So the first question is uh, for me, uh, how do you interpolate the results from each multi-layer meshes? Uh, hello, yeah. Uh, hi, Bruno. Uh, thank uh -huh. you for your question. So, uh, uh, can I uh, get it more clear? So are you talking about the preconditioner uh, or? Uh, yes, in your presentation at some point, uh, there, there was mm -hmm. the explanation that we were using multi-layer. So basically for, for each type of field, uh, we're going to use a different mesh, right? But you have to interpolate these results uh, so one uh, mesh knows about the other, right? So is it like uh, the meshes are uh, concentric, not concentric, but they are matching in the matching node? Matching uh, yeah, yeah. So currently we are using matching grid actually, oh, so okay. that will be easier for uh, uh, interpolating actually when you are using a multi grid algorithm. Uh, and uh, yeah. Okay, that's it. So yeah. So another question for you, Abiru, from Kiran, mm -hmm. very good friend as well. Um, <laughs> are there many additional difficulties difficulties in interpolated contact related quantities across different multi grid level? Or is it trivial? It's basically a very yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. question to mine, actually. Actually, this is a good question. So uh, so when you are dealing with contact, uh, it's very difficult while handling in multi-level uh, solutions, actually. So currently, we are using a, a motor uh, um, scheme, I mean, penalty scheme for uh, constraint enforcement. So in that case, actually, we don't need to do additional uh, manipulation for the multi levels actually so in that case we are safe but actually uh, our former colleague worked on the uh, especially for the saddle point problems actually so what uh, i think kiran was uh, discussing uh, in the first session i think yeah so we do have uh, we need to dis i mean distinguish between each kind of problem so for motor lagrosian multiplier method we need to have a different multi grid solver actually so I guess I answered your question. If you, if you want, actually, I can uh, send you uh, the the paper or like the, even the thesis from our former colleague. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we have uh, what I guess is our last question is uh, from Ruben Sevilla. 
so also another friend. Uh, so this question is for Paulo, the fifth presentation. How does the method behave in the incompressible limit? Okay, hi, uh, thank you for the question. So the, the standard method that we use is a PF formulation, so linear momentum deformation gradient, and it performs well uh, for the elastoplastic example that I presented. So there are some sort of incompressibility there, but when we go for uh, elasticity, nearly incompressible now who can material approach in Poisson's ratio of 0 0.45 or even greater than 0 0.45, then we need to activate the optional conservation law for the Jacobian, so the volume map, and there is some sort of numerical dissipation there that alleviates the problem. So then we can handle uh, nearly incompressible problems. So we can approach incompressibility in, in that way supplementing the scheme with uh, conservation law for the Jacobian. I don't know if this answers. Okay. Uh, actually, that was a question of mine as well that I was wondering. <laughs> well, uh, I think that's it for the session. Uh, I think it was a very inter interesting one. We have some very nice presentations. Uh, for the next part of the conference, we're going to have a coffee break from uh, 12, uh, 14.30 and 14.45. And after that, we're gonna have the first uh, plenary lecture from Stephanie Heath. And it's a very interesting one. Uh, the title is Efficient Data Structure for Data-Driven Mechanics. Thank you very much for, uh, for participating in our little section and enjoy the rest of the conference.